the subject of uh, things you need to know before you leave the house every morning. That's the title this morning. We're in the 12th chapter of the book of Luke. So if you have a Bible or you have a or somewhere where you can get some Bible words on there, go to the, the uh, 12th chapter of Luke this morning. Uh, let me tell you some of the things my mama taught me every morning. When, uh, when you get up, you have to... She, she would always make sure this stuff happened before we left the house every day. She would say, now boys, eat your breakfast because there's children starving in China. I never did figure out what my breakfast would do to help people starving in China, but she said for me to eat my breakfast because somebody explained that to me sometime how that worked. Apparently if I eat it here, it helps them there. I don't know. But she said always do that. Get your chores done. Always get your chores done. Uh, whenever we were uh, in high school, my brothers and I, we milked some cows. Uh, and um, getting up every morning, going to milk cows, we'd go up in the field and get them and ride them to the house, you know. And, and we literally, we did. We rode them like horses to the house. And uh, we'd milk them. And uh, we didn't have milking machines other than these, you know. The, these were our milking machines. And, and so we'd be milking cows and, and we'd take about three squirts in the bucket and we'd turn on each other and squirt a few. And, and uh, we... We had more fun. Actually, it was probably a waste of our time. But anyway, we milked cows. We got our chores done. Then Mom would say, boys, put on clean underwear. We don't want you to go off today. You might get in a car wreck and have to go to the hospital. And I said, Mother, if we got in a car wreck, we might have another accident. You know what I mean? Anyway, you always had to put on clean underwear before you went to school because you might have a car wreck. And she said to brush your teeth. And here's Mother's reasoning for brushing your teeth because uh, you won't have to get false teeth that way. So... Make sure you brush your teeth so you don't have to have false teeth. Comb your hair, and uh, that's not a problem for me anymore. But She said, wash your neck and behind your ears, make sure you wash. I said, I always thought, you know, I don't really want to do that. Mom said, it's because you can't, just because you can't see back there doesn't mean somebody else can't see back there. So we had to wash behind our ears and uh, make sure you got your lunch money. You ever have lunch money? You have to get your lunch money and get your books and, you know, get on out of here. Well, that's the things we had to do in the morning when I was a kid. We had to make sure we had those things in, in order. So we got on that bus with ready to go and learn and meet our world. Now, also, I uh, found out that whenever you are going to try to be a Christian, when you want to be somebody that loves the Lord and follow the leadership of God through your day, <coughs> through your week, you need to every day have a certain process, certain things you do, uh, that you uh, make sure you don't leave the house without. And so that ties right into a, a church this morning, into a sermon that I want to talk to you today about things you need to know before you leave the house every morning. Now, Jesus wants our faith to be an everyday experience. Uh, it's not a Sunday and then once a week experience, or it's not just an Easter and a Christmas experience. He wants us to, to be with Him and walk in His in His fellowship and in His love every day. And so there are things we need to do or know every day if, as we begin to practice our faith in the Lord. So following Jesus, as I said, is an everyday experience. And, and often people are discouraged with their Christianity or with their faith because they're not consistent enough. They're not consistent enough that it doesn't any good. It just kind of is an aggravation if you don't do it every day. But once in a, once you get the practices, once you get in the habit of following the Lord, of doing the certain things that need to be done, in time, it becomes a real blessing and a strength that comes into your life. So if you are having trouble and struggling with your Christian faith, maybe you need to practice it better and more daily, more regularly as it were. So every day, uh, make sure that you have your heart right and your head on straight before you leave the house every day. So that's what we're going to, to try to figure out today is, is uh, how, what do I need to know before I leave the house every day? What do I need to, do, to know if I'm going to be a, a follower of Jesus and really make my Christianity work? What are some things I have to be certain of? And I'm going to turn now to the 12th chapter of Luke and we're going to see if we can find the answers to that question and we'll begin in verse 4. Well, what do I need to know every day? First thing is you need to be, be sure that you're afraid of the right things and not afraid of some other things. So I want to talk about that. Let's read verse 4. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those 
who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now what Luke, or what Jesus is saying here, through Luke, is, is Jesus saying, there are some things you need to be worried about every day, but there are some things you need to not let be a stressor. You need to not have that in your life, any concern about that. And then what he said is, don't be afraid of people who can kill you, your body, but be afraid of those who can kill your spirit. Now let me unpack this just a little bit, because if you are not used to the Christian walk or the Christian conversation, you may be a little confused at this point. Because I want to clarify for you, we are not just physical. We are a duly formed creature. We are a synthesis of two different things. We're flesh and spirit. We're two different. We have a spirit, a spirit body, and we have a flesh body. Now you can't see my spirit body because it does not exist in a physical universe. It ex exists in a spiritual universe, which is right here. It's closer than you think, but it's it's here. We are. We are two. We're not just one. Now, when we die, our bodies, our physical bodies, are made of the dust of the earth, the ashes. They're, they'll turn right back into the elements of this planet. We'll turn back into dirt. And, uh, uh, and then, but our spirit is not of this earth. It is, and it goes to be with the Lord. Now, you can separate the spirit from the body, and when you do that separation then the body dies. It can't exist without it. But the spirit, now this, what you say, what is my spirit? Well, it's everything you are. It's everything you know. It's everything you experience. It's your thought life. It's your love. It's your joy. It's your peace. Everything about you that that uh, that is good and glorious about you is, is in the spirit form. When we die, that just goes home to be with the Lord. Now, Christians, we talk a lot about about how a person uh, can die twice. And you think, well, how do you die twice? Well, you die physically. There are some people who die physically. And then if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, let's say they've never been born again, they've never had, the, had faith in, in what Jesus did on the cross for them, that when they die, then they face a second death. And I, this is a horrible one. This is the one that's permanent. This is the one that's forever and it's called hell jesus called it hell it's a place where you go and die the second time so you say how can i be sure i would never die the second time well you have to be born again amen, amen. when you're born again you never die the second time because the first birth is flesh the second birth is spirit so when jesus comes to your life it's a spirit birth and he gives birth to that now don't give up on the body because even this old body is going to be resurrected one day. Did you know that? Yeah. We're not going to stay in those graves. Uh, it seems like every week I, I'm, I'm asked to help a family to, to go with them to a graveyard and go through a situation of, of saying goodbye to somebody they love. It's part of a pastor's life. And, and it's, it is a tough assignment, but it's also a joyful when I can stand and say to the family, this is not goodbye. We're going to see that person again. Because right. they're, they're going to home to be with the Lord. We're going to go one of these days and join them. We'll be with them again. But then I get to the graveyard and I, I say, but you see this old body we're going to put in the ground? <laughs> then here's something else I need to tell you. One day, that's going to come out of the ground and be changed. It's going to be resurrected. A new glorified body. Now, some people say, well, how's that even possible? Because some folks are blown up in explosions. Some are burned up and uh, in plane crashes or, you know, they're, they're lost in war or lost at sea. Let me, let's just think just a moment. The God that made us out of nothing, he'd have no trouble recollecting our molecules. You know what I'm right. saying? Amen. Wherever they are. That's going to be a small thing for God right. to resurrect our bodies. But they're sown in weakness. They're raised in power and glory. We're going to die. These old bodies are wearing out. But when they come back, they're going to be wonderful. Somebody says, well, what's our new body going to be like? And I said, I don't know, but it's going to be like Jesus. He said that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Okay, like Jesus. 
Well, what kind of a body did Jesus have? I don't know what kind of head, but there's but some things that it did and some things about it. Jesus would was able to uh, uh, appear in the middle of a room without walking through a door. Right. How about that? He just beamed in. Scotty beamed him in, you know. Like on Star Trek. Well, he beamed into a room. And I, I also I know Jesus was able to eat. <laughs> yes. In his glorified body. Man, I like to eat, don't you? I, boy, I about want to eat almost every day. I just love it. And, uh, but you, we're going to get to eat in our glorified body. Uh, Jesus ate with his disciples after the resurrection. And, and uh, he shared fellowship. And they could touch him. He told, he told Thomas, he said, Thomas, touch me. He put your hand there in my side where I was wounded, in my, uh, in my wrist where I, or my hands where I was nailed. He said, feel that. And so there was a physical physicality about him. So those are some neat things we're going to get to experience when we, with, we need to remember this every day because we, don't, we shouldn't be afraid of somebody that could kill us. Now, what does that do for us? See, when I walk out every day out of my house and I walk out into my world, I realize that a cow could kill me or a, a tractor could turn over, on, turn over on me or something could happen on the farm. You know, that's just, that happens. But when it happens, it's just to my body because my spirit gets to go home to be with the Lord. So I'm not afraid of facing my death. I'm not afraid of it. I've faced it several times in my life. I have faced it. Yeah, there's no fear in it. And uh, there's a fellow in this room this morning. I don't want to embarrass him. But he's already died once. And he went home, and he, but he came back. And he has written a book, and I, I read it, and it was a blessing to my life to get to read this book and to tell about what it was like when he went home and what heaven was like. And when, after we were talking out in the parking lot about it, I said, I bet you're not afraid to die now, are you? He said, not a, even a little bit. This because it's 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 nothing to it. It's just walking through a door and going into another place, into the presence of the Lord and in, in heaven. And it was uh, it's changed my life just getting to read the book and and talk to that to that gentleman. I don't want to embarrass him, but he's in the service right now. So we we are aware of the fact that that life is temporary, it's short, but eternity is forever. Now the second thing I want you to notice about this we pick up in verse six. Because some people in the room are, they think they're uh, worthless. I know, some of you think, I talk to you, I'm, I know. You, you know, people have told you you're not any good, you're worthless. Maybe your parents talk bad about you, told you, you know, you'd never amount to anything, and you're not worth anything. People tell us that. Children tell other children that, and they can be devastating. And some of you have grown up with, with the idea that you're worthless. You, you're nothing. But I want you to, t I want to tell you, you could not be more wrong. Right. You are valuable. You are precious in God's sight. Let's read verse 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. We live on a farm, and there's a lot of grain, and we feed chickens and cattle and things. And so we have a lot of birds around our house. And plus, we we feed birds like David. We we love to watch the birds, and, and so we feed them. So we have a lot of birds, and and I, there's a lot of sparrows. You know what a little little brown uh, sparrows? They all look alike. They're just dark brown and black and a little gray, and, and they're. But to me, there's no such thing as a junk bird. I think they're all pretty. And God knows every one of them. I thought, I wonder how many sparrows there are on planet Earth. My soul, there's billions and billions of, of sparrows. And God knows every one of them by name. Can you imagine that? That's the kind of God. But that's nothing. He said, that's nothing compared. Aren't you worth more than a sparrow? That's what he said. Oh, you're worth more than a sparrow to me. And you say, well, how, how valuable am I to God? Does God really care about me? Well, let me quote a verse. It says, For God so loved the world, or you could put your name there, God so loved me, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Does God love you? Yes, He loves you so much that He left heaven and came here and died just so you could be with Him 
in eternity. Amen. One of the verses and chapters in the Old Testament that I love to read, and I read this often through my week, is in my Bible study time and in my sermon prep time, I often go back to the 139th Psalm because it's such a joy to me to read this. Let me read a little of it. O oh Lord, You have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You, com you comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, You know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid Your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. See, that's what God knows about you. He knows when you sit down. He knows when you get up. He knows what you think. Before it gets from your brain to your tongue, He knows what that word is you're going to say. He knows everything about your path, your, your uh, idiosyncrasies, your peculiar personality traits or quirks. There's some, you know, some of you are kind of quirky, I'll be honest with you. And, and God knows everything about you, right? Everything about you. And even the hairs on your head. And then I want to close from this thought. I want to read Romans 8. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities or powers or things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing is going to be able to take you out of His hand. He loves you so much. He died for you. And when He gets you, there is nothing can separate you. Nothing can remove you. Folks, that's the kind of love that draws my heart to Jesus. That's the kind of love that changes a, a world and can change your life and your world. Now, the next thing I want to say uh, to you today about when you get ready to leave your house every morning, make sure that you are in total agreement with God. Total agreement. Now you say, okay, what are you talking about? Agreement. Let's read the 8th verse and then I'll explain it. Also, also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men. Now let me stop just a moment. I'm going to come back and we'll pick that up. Because there's a word we're going to have to hash out here. And it's the word confesses. Jesus said that you must confess me before men. What does that mean? That means you uh, raise my hand and I swear I'm going to confess. No, it means this. The word that we translate from Greek, which this was in Greek, and we bring it into English, is the word homo legeo. It means to say the same thing. You with me? To agree. To say the same thing. My hat is brown. You agree? Okay, so we agree my hat is brown. We are in confession. We have homo legeo. We say the same thing, but my hat is brown. And so when you say the same thing Jesus says, in other words, Jesus said, I love you, I want to save you, I want to be in your life, I want to walk, I want to live your life with you, I want to bless you, I want to help you. And when we say, yep, that's all right, Jesus, you're right, man. You're, we're walking together. We're in agreement. I'm trusting you. I'm confessing you. When we can, now let's go back and read the verse. Now. And also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me, that's the opposite of say the same thing. In other words, if you, my hat is brown, you say, no, it's gray. Okay? And then if you're saying that with God about your life, if you disagree with Him, then you are denying Him before men, and He will deny you before the angels of God. So there is this thing that's, that's vital to our lives. To remember, we need to be in agreement with God to say what He says about our life. And we, here, let me flesh this a little bit for you. You begin to live your day and you start out walking, uh, you get out of your car and you, you say, today I'm going to be selfish. Today I'm going to be mean, I'm going to be bitter. And I'm going to drive like I'm mad at everybody and I'm going to cut people off and, and, and I'm going to just be me today and take charge of my life. Well, you are walking in denial of the Lord. Because what He tells us to do, love God with all your heart and your neighbors yourself. And if you're not loving people, you're not agreeing with God. You're not confessing with Him, alright? So we need to be in confession with Him. Saying what He says. 
because it's important because he will one day either deny us or conf confess us before the angelic beings or the, the things in heaven. Please understand, I want you to get this very clear because we're saved because of the blood of Jesus. We walk with the Lord because we've been saved. But, we're, but we can set in motion this confession and denial in our lives. It's important. It's bigger than just us. Now, the next thing I want to tell you is that consistent rejection of that, of Jesus, consistently living a lifestyle in denial brings about the, the final horrible condition that we talk about so often, about leaving this world without Christ. And I have to tell you, if you step out into eternity, if you die, if your body dies and your soul goes out into eternity, because that's where it's going to go, then you have one of two destinations. There are only two destinations in eternity. There aren't three, there aren't four, there are two. It's heaven or hell. It's, it's with Jesus or away from Jesus. And I hate to be the one to bring you that bad news, but that's what the Bible says over and over and again. And I believe that it's important we leave this world with Jesus. So if you live a life consistently rejecting the Lord and you step out into eternity with consistent rejection in your heart, your future is not good. Let's read verse 10. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven him. Okay, well, let's stop. Who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus. That was His name for Himself. He said, I am the Son of Man, or the Son of God. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man. But He referred to Himself always as the Son of Man. And He says there, through Luke, He said, Luke, if somebody says something bad about me, that's forgivable. <laughs> if we slip and say, oh, Jesus, or or we cuss, or we say, we take God's name in vain, that's forgivable. We can, that's okay. It's, it's not okay, but we can have forgiveness for that. It's a slip. It's a temporary mistake. It's a sin, but it's, 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 it has an end to it. We don't want to stay there. We, we might slip up and say it, but we get out of it. We go on. But, what we're going to talk about now is consistent, lifelong rejection, and that's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When we blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that means we're doing it daily, moment by moment, all of our life. We just reject Him, we deny Him, and we don't walk with Him. Let's read the rest of it, and then we'll, we'll preach on it. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven Him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now, I have people who have come to me many times through the years and have said, Preacher, I'm afraid that I have blaspheme the Holy Spirit and that I cannot be saved. And I said, I want to tell you one thing, I promise you, because you worry about it, you've not done it. If you worried that you might have done it, you haven't done it. Because the person who's blasphemed the Holy Spirit is somebody that couldn't care less whether they've done it. They don't give a rip whether they blasphemed the Holy Spirit or not because they have lived a life of separation, of denial. They don't even know, they don't even care that they've done it. But if it's concerning to you, I promise you, 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 can, you still can be, you haven't done it. There's still hope for you. You haven't blasphemed it, the Holy Spirit. Let me read it. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, not because it's too big a sin for God to, to forgive, but because it is an attitude of heart that cares nothing for God's forgiveness. It never has forgiveness because it never wants forgiveness God's way. And there are people, there may be some in this room today, that you really don't want God's forgiveness. You don't believe. You don't want anything to do with that mess of church or the Bible or God. You don't think it's, there's anything truthful about it. Or you don't want it in your life. That's what I'm talking about, blasphemy. And that is unforgivable. In this world and the next world. My friend, if you leave this world without your heart right with Jesus... Your future is really, really grim. But if you know the Lord, of course, it's, it's wonderful. So, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. How, how do I make sure I don't do it? Then ask Jesus in your life. Be saved. Open your life. Say, Lord, here I am. Will you come and be my Savior? I, I want to be saved. I want you in my life. I don't want to be a blasphemer. I don't want to be a sinner, a consistent sinner. I want to be like you want me to be. And I want to be with you forever. That's... 
what Jesus is looking for in your life. Ask Him into your heart. You don't have to worry about the blasphemy. It's done. Okay, let's wind this up. Here's what we need to know. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Once you invite the Lord into your life, He will guide you every moment of your day. And if you'll listen to Him, He'll lead you through every part of it, no matter how hard it is, no matter how easy it is, He'll lead you through it all. He'll give you the words you need to say. He'll give you the thoughts you need to think. Let's read this verse 11. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates, by the way, that's religious authority or legal authority or governmental authority. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. God will give you the words you need when you need them. Now, in, I've relied on that for my entire pastoral life. You, you talk about difficult. Try being in a counseling situation with someone with very difficult problems. On, and they say, what should I do? And I'll be careful. I'll be honest with you. I'm always very slow to respond. No, I never want to speak because I'm waiting. <laughs> what am I waiting for? I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak inside me. Because I know when God speaks in me, and then I say what He says, then I've given that person great counsel. And that's a great thing all of us need to know. Whenever you're in these difficult situations, making hard choices, dealing with difficult people, and you're like, what do I do? You wait and let the Lord give you the word, the decision. You let the Lord help you through that difficult time. Because He said, for the Holy Spirit will teach you what you need in that very hour. In that moment, while you're there, He will tell you what you need. Okay, here we go. What do I do now? Well, live in such a way that you depend upon the leadership of God for every part of your life. And follow Him all the way. And then finally, don't leave this world without Him. Don't live without Him. But be sure and don't leave without Him. One thing I always want to tell people, it's because I have had so many times to stand and preach somebody's funeral, and honestly, the mom and dad or the wife or the husband or the grandkids, they don't know where that guy is or that gal is because they they don't know what their life was like with the Lord. They don't know if they were saved, if they were if they followed the Lord, if they were you know blasphemous or if they were faithful. They don't know. And so I, many times I've had to preach funerals and the family didn't know where the dead person was. Here's the thing. Do yourself a favor, but do your family a favor and leave a forwarding address. That's right. Amen? Amen? Let your people know where you are. So when their time comes, they can meet and be with you there, or at least they'll know where you are. Don't go out of this world with, with a blank look on your face like, I don't know where I'm going. Make sure you know. How do you know? Trust the Lord. Be saved. Receive Him. Be born again. Born once die twice. Born twice, die once. And that don't count anyway. That's just temporary. Death is temporary, physically. Spiritually, it's forever. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. Yeah.